Hi, and welcome to this video. In this video, I would like to talk a little bit about writing code that makes mistakes harder to make. Over time, I've worked on a lot of code bases, and I've seen that there's a lot of common mistakes that people make when they write their code. For example, they are writing a ton of if statements to determine whether they should show one screen or the other. Or maybe they have enormous switches with all kinds of conditions and nesting to determine what a certain state of an application is. Duplicated code is another common example where developers have copy-pasted pieces of business logic into different parts of the code base instead of abstracting it. These are often symptoms of a bigger problem. And I'm not trying to say that every time you hit copy-paste, it's a bad thing, or every if statement that's a little bit large or complicated is a bad thing, right? There's always some middle ground to be found. And in this video, I would like to talk about some of the considerations that you can take into account when you're writing your code and avoiding mistakes. So mistakes can creep in over time. I've seen code bases that clearly started out fine, but over time, the code base grew more complicated, the business logic became more complicated, and after a couple of years, you're in a state where the code is really hard to work with. And avoiding this is essential to making sure that everybody working on the code base is happy and productive. So we can be vigilant whenever we write code and keep an eye out for common mistakes. And let's start by talking about mistakes as a result of code duplication. Consider the following example. We have a struct here with a view and this view presents a user's name, or more specifically, they present a user's name and their email behind it, right? There's a specific formatting that we're using here to show this user's name, and we might want to use this in multiple places. On its own, this code is completely fine. And once the app grows and we add more places, we would end up duplicating this code if we keep the logic for formatting inside of the view. Initially, that's okay. Right, maybe there's one more place where we show this user's name. And thinking too long and hard about an abstraction for this could be problematic because we want to keep our production moving. So copy-pasting once might not be an issue. But over time, that once becomes twice, three times, four times. And at some point, you're going to end up with way too many places that format this user's name in slightly different ways because you forgot to update one part or the other as the time went on. We could try abstracting this pattern of formatting a user's name as follows. Right now, our view model has a formatted username and our struct simply asks the view model for the formatted username. From a view perspective, this looks fantastic. We no longer have to think about how we format a user's name. The view model is simply going to tell us. However, this view model might not be usable for every piece of code. So we did abstract this, but maybe we didn't do the best job at it. So let's try something else. We can change our code to look like this. Now our user has a formatted username property that formats its own given name, family name, and email. This is great because now every place that has access to a user can ask the user for its formatted name. So if we update the view like we did in this example, where the view has the view model and it asks the view model for the user and the user for the formatted name, that's a little bit of a problem, right? The nice thing is that the view no longer decides how to format the username. The nice thing also is that the view model no longer decides how to format a username. But we are uh, having an implicit dependency now on our view model, or within our view model, rather. And that also means that we're violating something called the law of the meter. The law of the meter means that having code that accesses properties of its own properties, like we do here, is bad. We should not be accessing the user on the view model and then the formatted name on the user that we got from the view model. Because now we don't only depend on our view having a view model with a specific property. We also depend on that object, in this case the user, having the property that we are interested in. So we're building this chain of dependencies that we do not want. We can update our code to fix this rather easily. We can simply give our user the formatted name, our view model gets a formatted name as well, and that proxies user.formatted name. Now, our view asks the view model for a formatted name, and it doesn't really care how that formatted name came to be. All it cares about is that there is a formatted name, and it's no longer doing the figuring out of the formatting on its own. With our code looking like this, we optimize reuse because every place that has access to the user can get a formatted username. 
but we also don't violate the law of Demeter, which means that we don't have any implicit dependencies. So that's really good. Another source of code duplication that we need to take into account could be the styling of UI elements. Whenever you reach for command C in your code to duplicate something like a button style, you should ask yourself whether you'll be copying this code more often. Are you designing a button that just happens to be red and have the same color of red as another button? Or are you actually designing another primary button that should always have the same consistent style? Sometimes this is obvious and you can anticipate code duplication because that thing that you're copying is clearly something that's more of a pattern or standard in your code base than a one-off or a two-off kind of situation. If your abstraction is very lightweight, like the one that we just wrote for our user name formatting, you might want to consider being a little bit less uh, forgiving when you're copy pasting, right? Showing the username in two places and having a very simple abstraction available, we should be using that. If the abstraction is more complicated, we might have an argument to say, you know what, let's see if we copy paste this three or four times before we actually start abstracting. Your more expensive abstractions can really wait. Trust me on that one. Other mistakes that you might make are related to complicated state. Right? Every app manages state in one way or the other, and managing state is really hard. And if anybody tells you otherwise, don't trust them. They're lying to you. Managing state is really, really hard, especially as your apps grow bigger and bigger over time. My favorite example of a place where state is managed rather poorly, in my opinion, is an URL session. Let's take a look at an example. Over here, we're calling URL session share data task, and we're getting a data response and error back from that data task. We're checking that our error is nil, and if it is, we can handle the error and return out from the function. We know that data and response should be nil in this case. If the error was nil, then we can go on ahead and access our data and response. Because if there's no error, there should be a data and response. If all are nil, which unfortunately is possible in the API design, we have an invalid or impossible state on our hands. We cannot have all three being nil, but the compiler cannot help us here. So we need to account for a state that's completely impossible to be in, simply because the API design said that our state can have three nil properties, even though in practice never we see three nil properties. So how could that be improved? Well, for example, the result type could be used instead of uh, three properties. We would have a single result that has a success case with data and a response and a failure case with an error. We could also have separate callbacks on success on failure, or we could use oh, async await in this specific example, because for async await, Apple did solve this issue, right? In async await, we can do something like do let data response equals try await and then call URL session. And if that all worked, if a request actually made it to the server and came back with a response, data and response are returned to us. If something went wrong, we get an error and data and response are simply not given to us. So in this example, the state is now managed much cleaner because we can no longer reason about states that are simply not possible to be in. And that is important and very nice. We can also make mistakes that I call mistakes as a result of not knowing the magical incantation. Sometimes people write code that expects a developer to do things in a certain way. For example, you might have to set a property on a view model before you call its parse method. Just an example that I came up with just now. And there's actually an example of not knowing the magical incantation or having to know the magical incantation in UIKit specifically in the view controller containment API. Take a look at this code. If we want to add a child view controller to another view controller, we have to call add child view controller, which adds the view controller as a child view controller. And then we have to say a child view controller did move to parent and then self, right? So this tells the child view controller that it now has a parent view controller. This isn't too bad, right? We, we simply had to call add child and then tell the view controller that it now has a parent not the worst thing in the world. However, when we want to remove a child view controller, the process is not the same because then we have to call will move before we call remove parent, remove from parent. And that's weird, right? Because we have to know this. And to be honest, I need to look this up every single time because I always forget 
what the order of things is. And so what I often ended up doing was to say, I'm going to call will move and then add or remove and then did move, right? That's not the best, but we can do that safely. And I haven't seen any problems because of it, but Apple could have done a better job designing this, I think. I'm sure they had their reasons, but from an API user perspective, this isn't very friendly because I have to know the magical incantation to work with view controller containment. If you design your own code and your own APIs, which you're doing all the time when you're writing code, you want to prevent situations from this from happening. Make sure that your APIs prevent developers from doing things in the wrong order as much as you can. And there's a post on API design that I'll link to in the comments uh, from Dave DeLong. And he said that a great API is kind to all developers who work with it. And I really like that quote because it shows that we need to, to make sure that whenever we design an API, developers are not struggling to use it and they're not afraid to make mistakes, right? Whenever a developer does something wrong, we should throw errors in a good way. We should make sure that our program fails in predictable ways. And ideally we should even make sure that our program does not even compile when the developer is about to make a mistake. Whenever you're modeling your state, you should of course be careful. And more particularly, you should be careful when you're working with if statements and switches in certain cases. If you have an if statement that has a lot of conditions, like is the user logged in, do they have a name set, have they seen the sign up screen or whatever, um, that could be a sign that there are a lot of under, undeterministic, impossible, or incorrect states that could be represented. Think back to the situation with the URL session where we could have data response and error all three be nil. That means that they could also all three be non-nil. And these are situations that are impossible to happen, but we still have to account for them because we are navigating sort of a three state situation. Not perfect, not great. Having enums can help, right? Result type is an enum. This enum says, if we have a success, then these two should be there. If we have a failure, then this one case should be there. And designing your APIs like that is great because it means that we are making it really hard to represent states that shouldn't or cannot exist. And over time, you'll develop a sense when you know that things are off. You'll be writing code and you'll think to yourself, hold on a second, this feels like I'm doing too much work or like I'm doing too little work or just feels like this could go wrong in the future or I have to know a lot of things to do this thing correctly. And when you know things are off, it's time to think about correcting that. It's time to look whether you can simplify things whether you can make a tiny little abstraction that wraps a bunch of state in an enum or wraps a bunch of state in some other object or even redesign the API altogether, depending on the time you have, and depending on how big the problem might become according to your code senses. Now note that not all complex code is terrible. Sometimes code feels off and it feels like this should be a lot easier and there just isn't a good way to achieve that, at least not that you know of, and that might be okay. It's always good to keep it in the back of your mind and maybe ask help from some of your coworkers or friends or anybody on the internet to see if they might have any smart ideas to simplify your complicated code. But sometimes it just is what it is and it's not worth fixing. Let's summarize this video. Writing good code can be really hard. You've seen a couple of examples of mistakes that I've seen people make in code many times. And some of these mistakes are relatively simple to avoid, others are really hard to avoid. And as your code base becomes more complicated, the problems you're facing scale with it. So solving them early can be a really good way to prevent having to solve really complicated problems down the line. By far the most complex problem I've seen is managing state. State is really hard and SwiftUI does make state management a little bit easier, but it's still really, really hard. So that's where you should be focusing your attention most if it were up to me. Now let me pass up a question to you though, the viewer. What are some common mistakes that you have learned to avoid? I would love to hear that in the comments and I would love to hear what you think of this video. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one. Cheers.